Welcome. This is Larry Hilliard. We are coming to you from Southern California on a very steamy Sunday evening. We come to you and we're privileged to come into your presence with the Word of God. And whatever medium you're watching this on, a flat screen, laptop, device, or maybe you've been listening to it in your car through using Bluetooth and plugging into YouTube. But we've been streaming for over two years, and in that time, we've been able to get up over 250 uh, teaching modules on theology, Christology, exegetic, and expositional preaching. We teach in an expositional and exegetical manner. We teach theology and Christology. And if you go back into the library that we have on YouTube, you can find a virtual library that's open 24-7, starting at some of the rudiments of Christology and the themes of theology. And I would ask you to avail yourself of them. It is a non-tuitional education. And you'll get an education in theology, biblical exegetic, biblical exposition. This is a site, a channel for mature people that are wanting the meat of the Word of God and that have a hunger to know Him and are looking for the coming of the eternal Son of God. We are at a time in America's history where we definitely need to hear the Word of God. We're going to be preaching on a theme tonight entitled, O God, Be Not Silent. O God, Be Not Silent. Because the concept of the silence of God was a was a nightmarish idea, a nightmarish prospect in the heart of the remnant of believing Jews in Judah and Israel and the Old Testament. They thought if God would ever ignore them, would ever turn his face from them, would ever be passive to them, to their plea, that it would be like someone that goes down to the grave without hope. So we'll be teaching on that theme and how America is coming to a watershed, a demarcation line that we may have already crossed as a nation from the favor of God to the outpouring of his chastening and of his wrath. But before we go to any preliminaries tonight, we're going before the throne of God. The psalmist cried out in Psalms 120 verse 1, I cried out unto the Lord in my trouble, and he answered me. He used the Hebrew word czar for trouble. And, it, and if you've listened to me for any time, you know that we, we, we have a glossary. If you keep a glossary of many of the Greek and Hebrew words that we define, you'll have a dictionary that you can go back for your own edification. But the word trouble are also translated distress in the, in the Old Testament. It comes from a, Greek, a Hebrew word czar, and it means Oh, Lord, I'm surrounded by constriction. I'm surrounded by pressure. I'm surrounded by lack of resources where I am depleted, oh, Lord, and I need your help, whether it be spiritual, mental, physical, financial, national, security, domestic. Oh, Lord, I don't have the resources, and I'm crying out to you. And if we've been teaching about prayer for many, many months on this channel, that is the condition that God architects and brings us to so that that would be a true, a, a true petition unto God. True prayer is not me being an associate with God, me initiating anything, me trying to manipulate God or having a precondition of what I think God wants. It's me coming, the individual, with an empty hand. And I come in an empty hand to God who has all the resources, endemic to him as his native home. And we and between the, the 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 redeemed and God, there is this vast gulf that we come from the earth, and he is the eternal God. We never have the resources that we need to survive. God has made us to be God dependent from beginning to end and throughout all eternity. So when we come before the throne of grace. We're saying to God, oh, Lord, I do not have what I'm facing. I do not have what it takes to meet the challenge, the pressures, the, the circumstances that I'm surrounded today. But I come to you and I cry. And it's a word of emergency, urgency, like urgent care. And I come to the God who's Yahweh, the God that says, I am that I am. 
I am all that you will ever need because in me is life eternal. I'm the essence of life itself. So when we come before his throne tonight, we come in polar opposite, not in some kind of advisory capacity or counseling to God. We're the polar opposite of God. We need everything. God needs nothing. And in that posture, that is the that is the biblical posture of prayer and the biblical characterization of petition. And without as a foundation, let us pray tonight. Lord, we come before your throne. We need you desperately. That's just not a verbalization. That is from the depths of our being, we cry. And you bring your people to cul-de-sacs of despair so that you could teach them that without you, we truly are nothing. And that, if, and that if you do not intervene in every microsecond of our life, we are completely depleted of any hope in life. And Lord, I pray for your people tonight, wherever they are that are picking up this stream, I pray for the families that are being assaulted by alien thinking and an alien government and an alien school system. I pray for the fathers and mothers that will counsel their children and and be a shield over their minds and will be very cognizant of what's going into their spirits and that they will teach them that there is an eternal God and that he's coming soon and the opinions of man mean nothing to God, but everything that comes out of your mouth is eternal. Strengthen those parents, O oh Lord, in your name. Strengthen them and also bring answers to those families where they've stretched their budget about as far as they can, and multiply what they have. Take what they have like the little boy with the loaves and fishes. Take what they have and multiply it, Lord. Do a miracle in their home and lead people across their path or open doors of, of resources and occupations that will bring them a greater resource that to meet the needs of their family in a time of, of constriction economically. We pray for that person that is so sick tonight. They fear going to the hospital, but they're sick. They need a touch from you. Reach down from heaven, Lord, and touch their body. Bring a healing to that man, a healing to that woman that is so in need of you, and reveal your glory as you touch them, Lord. We don't command you. We don't, we don't advise you, but you, we ask on their behalf that in your mercy, if you would do that for them, I know that they would be eternally grateful to you and it would reveal your glory. And we pray that you bring that one person out of the tomb of death, that they would hear you call their name as you call Lazarus, that they would come forth, come forth on resurrection ground and you would give them the gift of faith, the gift of repentance, and that you would lead and draw them to you that you're the initiator of all aspects of salvation. And when the last syllable is spoken this evening, I pray that your son would be glorified, that it would be like stringing a pearl necklace, that the pearls of your word would be like a necklace, a haraz that would be lifted up to you, and, and this mortal from the earth would lift it up to you, and I pray it would give you glory. And turn our all of our eyes to the throne, that we will be anticipating your coming, fixate our attention on you and off a dying world, and we ask everything in the name of our great high priest who represents us before the throne of you, Father, in your glorious name. Amen. We thank the Lord tonight. In Amos 3, 2, the prophet said of the men, the leadership of his day, who he called economic, political, militaristic, and religious cannibals, because they were raping the people. The people were only existing for their profit. And they had turned their positions of, of representing God and educating the people into the ways of God. They had turned it into nothing but profiteering. And Amos the prophet said of these leaders, these are those who hate the good and they love the evil. They hate the good and they love the evil. In fact, Amos was saying that they were a, uh, th this situation was destroying the presidential truth. In other words, he was saying they have inverted everything of, of truth. Leadership inverts things for their own pragmatic 
uh, their own pragmatic uh, garnering or, or expansion. And Amos the prophet said they warp the language and they warp the essence of society. And he said they hate the good. The word good in the Hebrew means tab. And it's a word that comes out where God said, he, it said God is good. And it's a word that means God is good because he's a good God. He's not good because we do something to engender the goodness from God. It's not something because he rewards us with his goodness. It means that he is unmerciful unmerciless. He is unmerciless God. He doesn't have mercenary motives when he gives good. He doesn't have mercenary motives when he bestows his bounty on man. He sends the rain and the sun on the just and unjust. But when, when leadership turns evil, they say that that's not good. The good is what we define good that comes through us. It's not the goodness of God. It's the goodness that we think that we've generated goodness. We've done this for that. We've, 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 uh, we have garnered the goodness. We've produced the goodness. We've manufactured the goodness. So they've warped that, that axiomatic truth. And it said they love the evil. The word evil in Hebrew is raw. It means it's a word that means broken. It means distorted. It means twisted. It means perverted. It means so come a time in a nation, the leadership, when they will pervert, they will distort, they will break everything that is right, everything that is truthful, everything that is faithful, everything that is pure and holy, they will warp it and pervert it and corrupt it and twist it like taking a rope and twisting it. They'll twist everything of the word of God, everything that God is. They will twist it to try to make it for their own advantage. And we're living in a day in our day where that diagnosis is certainly applicable. We have leadership that hate the good and they love the raw. They love the perverted. They love the, the distorted. They love the corrupt. And they lived to do that. In Isaiah 5, verse 20, Isaiah in his day defined the people in leadership. He said, woe to those who call good evil, who call evil good and good evil who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. He said, whoa, it's a Hebrew word that means the judgment of God is resting on your head to those who call evil good and good evil. Isaiah was confronting a leadership very much like Amos was, that they were trying to redefine the lexicon of life. They're trying to redefine the dictionary of the word of God in the dictionary of what we call axiomatic truth. As I have a preamble to this message tonight, I'm, I'm laying a foundation that we're living in a time that's replicating the time of Isaiah, Amos, and very much so Jeremiah. We're living in a time when the leadership wants to redefine axiomatic or what we call universal truth. I'll give you an illustration of axiomatic truth. Axiomatic or universal truth is truth that is that is unassailable wherever you go on the globe. You could say water freezes at the same temperature in the U.S. as it does in Russia or China. Water boils at the same time that it uh, at freezes or boils in China. Uh, uh, men have to breathe to live. That's true all over the world. We live and we die. That's an axiomatic truth anywhere in the world. And one of the universal truths is that the universe had a beginning. We know that axiomatically now. It's not a it's not a Aristotelian steady state theory that all things have been. Even science and astronomy tells us all, astro, uh, astronomers and astrophysicists tell us that even the universe had a beginning. They agree with Genesis one one, and that's called a universal truth. It's not debatable. But what does leadership do when it becomes so wicked? It wants to take axiomatic truth, universal truth, and invert it, corrupt it. It's like going to a library or going to on your web into your, uh, your notebook and pulling up dictionary.com or going to a mortar and brick, a library, and, and, and overnight someone has changed the definition of every word. You go to light and it says darkness. You go to darkness, it says light. You go to sin, it says righteousness. You go to righteousness, it says sin. You, you go to air, it says 
it says uh, mud. And you go to water, it says soil. You go to, you, you look up uh, sun, it says moon. Everything has been changed. And in a society like that, that has not been taught axiomatic truth or not been prepared, the, the, the society becomes confused. And they begin to follow the leaders that have redefined truth, redefined the dictionary of life, and redefined the word of God. And Isaiah said not only do they invert the truth, but they substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. They're not content with redefining the lexicon of life. What they want to do is, is, is establish it as true. For instance, in our day, no one would have thought 10 years ago anyone would have been given a hearing if they stood up on a national platform and said, we don't know what a woman is, are there more than two sexes? That wouldn't have even given a hearing. But today, because of the society is trying to warp the lexicon of people's mind, they want to insert into the cranium the idea that just maybe that's right. In a generation whose minds are preconditioned for this, they begin to plant the seed. Well, maybe that definition, well, maybe it has some semblance. And once they get their hook into that cranium, they begin to forge them and mold them by a redefinition of the lexicon of life. And we're living in that day in America where every, every recognized truth is being redefined. Every recognized axiom is being redefined by those who have the highest decibel level and have the most prominent platform. And it seeped its way into every school system, the public schools even into K, because books are now being printed showing that men could carry a child and have birth, and they're being exposed to children as young as K. What is a society doing? It's a society that Isaiah said, Woe to those, judgment on those who call good evil, good evil, evil good, who substitute darkness for light, light to darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. They've inverted the axioms of life and they've, they've developed and they've, and they've produced a society that only believes what they have to say. They become the living lexicon of life and not the scriptures which they discount as being antiquated, and they became become the living Torah of a people. Yes, America right now is very much, uh, in many ways, as we will see tonight, mirroring uh, presidential rise and fall of nations that have gone before. And, uh, and one of the things that is a, a cognate evil that's going on with the desire to redefine truth is there is an ideology in America called, called predestination era, predestinary politics or ideology of the left. And that means that there's a belief system that, that, that an ideology can become so powerful over the individual that they can ordain life, death, they can ordain the, the, the inception of life, the, or the aborting of life, the production of life, life to live and die after birth, they can ordain life at the end of life, and they can ordain the quality of life in between. They believe that they have a predestinary authority given to them by their ideology anointed that they can ordain where people go to school, what the curriculum will be, the kind of things, the kind of jobs that they will work in, the, ec the economic stratas that they will function in, the amount of money that they will make, where they will live, how they will think, how they can speak, who they will vote for, and what they can see in public. And they have arrogated to themselves a predestinarian view of politics. And it's always totalitarian when you come to that. But they cloak it in a close that we are going to become the maternal and the uh, paternal uh, uh, cares, caregivers of society. And that has inroads into a society that wants to be cared for, but it's like being cared for by an evil, evil demon, not someone that's a human that has a heart for God. And into this predestinarian 
uh, orthodoxy of the left, the liberal left, comes censorship. And I want to give, before I go into my message tonight, an admonition to the people that listen to me and other true voices of the word. And I would say at the beginning, there's less and less true voices of the word found on the media and even in local churches. But there's coming a censorship over the land. Uh, a censorship is already raging over America. And there will eventually be a censorship to men that teach the unadulterated word because that teaching will be looked upon as, as insinuary. It will be looked upon as polemical. And they will want to get rid of anyone that declares there's wrath, there's judgment, there's hell, there's a sovereign God, there's a holy God, there is sin and there is atonement, and that man under sin is going to be judged eternally. They want to excise that from the from the marketplace of ideas. So ultimately, the voices, and I am just a small voice. I don't have uh, a visions of grandeur. But whatever the voice that I have, we're preparing now for a day when my voice and others will be taken off the social media. And I'm going to ask you now, I'm going to admonish you. When that day comes, I want you to do one simple thing for me. Put my email address away. Treasure it away. My email address is exeget. It's a Greek word that means an interpreter. It's a word that comes out of scripture. It means to interpret scripture. It's spelled E-X-E-G-E-T-E. E-X-E-G-E-T-E -E -E at M-A-I-L dot com. And if that day comes when YouTube or Facebook takes this voice off, we are working right now on other alternative platforms that we can get our video streams to. But if those are taken away, there are other avenues that we can get the word of God out to you at that time. And I'm alerting you at this because Jesus told us in Matthew 10, verse 16, he warned the disciples. He said, be, he said, be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Matthew 10. Verse 16. And what does that mean to be wise as serpents? A serpent can feel the vibrations of the earth about a mile away when something is coming in his purview or his in his direction. He has the capability of feeling the vibrations of what's coming. And Jesus was saying to the disciples, I want you to be a discerning group. I want you to know what's coming. I don't you I do not want you to take be be unaware of what's coming on the horizon. I want you to be keen and discerning. I want you to know what is, what's on the horizon that, that can give you deleterious to your being. So I'm saying to you, the people of God need to be as wise as a serpent. We need to know that off in the horizon, there is danger coming. There is, there is totalitarian spirit. There's there is a blatant uh, a censorship that's building. There's evil that's becoming more and more unrestrained. And so when that day comes, I urge you to maintain that simple address that I give. And of course, after every message, if you link on the description of the message at the bottom, it gives our email address. But sit, But treasure that away, because when that day comes, we'll stay in contact with you and we'll get out the message of God some way to those that are hungry. And I'm just giving you that as a warning and to be prepared. Because we're living in a society where God's not promised that he's going to change the world. I know there's a false teaching all throughout the megachurch today. It's in, it's in hell. I call them hell song from Australia that's bred this teaching of, they call it the new apostolic reformation which is just a regurgitation of the uh, manifest sons that, were, that took hold in America in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. And it means, in essence, that they are teaching that God will so glorify and raise up a people that they will be able to control the economy of the earth, control life and death so that they can go into, um, go into cemeteries, raise the dead, go into hospitals, empty them, go into 
to uh, uh, funeral parlors that empty them, take over nations, and once they take over the earth by their signs, ones, and mir miracles, then Jesus will come back and they will give the earth to Jesus and he won't judge the earth, but he'll bring them in to what they already think is their heaven on earth. Well, God's never promised that. That's just, they've been seduced by Genesis 3-4. The, the, the seduction of Satan, you shall be as Elohim. They've been seduced by that. That teaching is regnant all throughout the church right now, where, where they're teaching that God's going to remake the world. He's going to make the world new. He's going to renovate the world. The scripture doesn't say that. It says in 1 John 2, uh, um, tw uh, 1 John 2, 12 through 15, that he said that um, the world is passing away. He's leading it as a procession to the graveyard with every passing second. He's leading it to a place where he will ultimately pour out his wrath on all the universe and of the earth. And in prelude to that, he will take his people. So he's not preparing the world to remake it or to make it new. I just recently heard someone like Greg Laurie and Jack Hibbs of Calvary Chapel say, that God's out to make new the world. He's not out to make new the world. He's out to bring from the dead all of those that are in sin that he's ordained from eternity and bring them to him and prepare them for eternity. But he's not out to make new the earth. He's out to judge the world and prepare us for a new world. So that with that as a prelude, we tell you tonight, be prepared, be ready for what's coming. And as we transition now to our message, it's entitled, Oh God, Be Not Silent. We are living in a transitional stage in America's history. We are living right now in a transitional stage in America's history where the word of God is being subordinated under the word of man. The word of second-rate and third-rate local politicians, the word of medical messiahs, the word of economic uh, forecasters, the word of false prophets carry much more weight to the ear of the vast uh, citizens of America than the eternal word of God is. We are li living in an transitional stage where the word of man has become more more dominant, has become more powerful, has become more influential than the eternal word itself. And into that dominance of the word of man has come this, this, this uh, corrective of God, this judgment of God that the Old Testament call the silence of God. There is a time in a history's nation, and we will give you precedence in a moment, where the society listens only to the word of man, only to the verbiage of the human, only to the words of those that come out of the granules of sand. And they subordinate the word of God to an to a antiquated position. And in that time frame, God says, if you've done me this way, then I'll be silent to you. For that the only voice that you have is the voice of man that is, is futile, empty, and is only circular. And God is saying to America right now, you've listened to every voice for decades. You followed every Pied Piper and you have based your future on those words. I will go into a time of my silence. And the word silence, as we'll see from the Old Testament, means at a time when he will not answer prayers of deliverance for a nation. He will not show his favor any longer for a nation. He will not be merciful any longer for a nation, but he will begin to thunder and his chastening and judgment to a nation because they cross the demarcation line. And God says, you've trip wired my judgment. You, you've trip wired my wrath. I've held it like a dam for, 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 for centuries. And now the dam is beginning to break. In the history of Israel, as an admonition to us tonight, they tragically knew times when God was silent to them. Whole centuries, northern Israel, we call it the ten tribes, where in the time of Jesus, it was called Galilee of the Gentiles. They went 700 years 
of judgment after God brought in Assyria in 722 B.C. They went 700 years of darkness, superstition, ignorance, demonism, without hearing the voice of God. The southern two tribes of Judah and Benjamin, and they're in the same area of Jerusalem, they went 450 years after the last king, after, after Malachi died. They, between Malachi and Matthew, there's 450 years of intertestamental literature, and in that period, they had no voice of the true prophet of God that was calling them back to God. And until the time where John the Baptist cried out, you generation of vipers who shall deliver you from the wrath of God to come, they had not heard the voice of a man of God for 450 years. And there were times in European history we call the Dark Ages where they went for centuries without, it would have been rare to find a man of God anywhere in the world. So there are precedents to this time of the silence of God. In this period, God will continue to speak to his remnant, but he will not speak outside of that anymore. Abraham Heschel, a 1950 Jewish scholar and philosopher, said, God is not simply available once and for all to be found whenever a man so ever desires. There is an alternative to God's presence, namely his absence, God may withdraw and detach himself from history. Receiving the word of God is a wonder that does not always come to pass. Receiving the word of God is a miracle. If you are listening to this stream tonight and the word of God is clear to you, it's understandable to you, you understand by the interpretive ability that the Holy Spirit has brought into you, then you have standing under a wonder. You're standing under a miracle of Almighty God. Because to the vast majority of those in and out of the church, this word is nothing but a manual. It's nothing but a self-help book. It's even more degraded. It's nothing more than like giving a, a book on nuclear physics to an infant. It means no sense at all. But there are times when God will say, I'm not going to enlighten like I have in the past. I will enlighten a few of my people that I raised from the dead that I chose in eternity, but I will enlighten on a, on a very select and a unique level, but I will not lighten like I have in the past. And the rest of the nation will live in darkness and follow the Pied Pipers of the word of man. We have been inundated for the last several decades that man listens to the eye of man. We follow the ego of man, but we have not listened to and followed the eye and the nature of God. And because of that, coming on America is this, this inchoate stage of his judgment and his chastening that he says, my message, my word, my my." My authority has been so demeaned, so degraded, so misinterpreted, and so redefined that I'm going to call it a time of my silence to this nation. And after 400 years, America has entered into a time of the silence of God. Go with me to Deuteronomy 29, and we will see what God says to a people who saw every miracle uh, on the face of the earth, and every miracle from A to G, A to Z, they saw, and this was their uh, this was their reaction. Deuteronomy twenty nine, starting at verse two. And Moses summoned, and let me give a preface. We have taught in the past where God would give a warning to Israel in the wilderness. We call it a teshakpa. And a warning was that if you will obey me, I will bring peace to your life. The word means shalom. It means I will bring an economic, uh, economic harmony, ecological harmony, biological harmony, spiritual harmony, national harmony, if you obey my word. But if you disobey me and redefine me and turn to the gods of the nations, 
I am going to bring a curse or a judgment over you. And I will bring economic, ecological, biological, physical, national calamity on you. And that's what we call in the Hebrew a tashakba, a warning admonition. But what we're reading now is not a warning. This is given after the 40 years of the wilderness generation where they continually tempted God. And this is the death warrant or the death sentence that God has given to that original generation. He's stating your death warrant of why he's telling them that they will die in the wilderness. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, you have seen all the Lord, all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials with which your eyes have seen, the great signs and wonders, Yet to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. Your clothes have not worn out, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. God said, as a death warrant, I have not given you a heart to know, nor eyes to see, nor ears to hear. At the end of 40 years, where they saw every miracle, and word, let me just break down the word signs and miracles. For 40 years, the word sign, oath, it means a token or a semblance that God is in your presence. What was a sign? The fire by night that kept them warm, the, the, the pillar of cloud by day that kept them their AC uh, that was all a sign, an incessant sign for 40 years that God was in their presence, that God was right there traveling through the wilderness with them. So they had no reason not to believe. They had a palpable, phenomenal sign right in front of them that God was there with them. And the word miracle is mopeth, and it comes from a Hebrew root that means to persuade, to persuade. And, 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 and to a proof of God's protection and his, and his presence to persuade them that he was a faithful God. But in the midst of that, they were an unpersuadable people. What did they do in the midst of the signs and the wonders? They said repeatedly, could God spread a table in the wilderness? Other words, we want more miracles to override our unbelief. We want more miracles to override the things that we, we, we need you to transcend are doubts and questions. And like it says in Deuteronomy 8, 2, God afflicted them and sent and tested them for 40 years to teach them that what was in their heart. But they didn't learn what was in their heart. They were, they were self-deceived. They thought that they could command God, that he was just there to, to give them perpetual miracles. And God said at the end of the 40 years, and the emphasis in the Hebrew is this, you wouldn't believe, now you can't believe. You wouldn't hear, now you can't hear. You wouldn't see, now you can't see. And I'll say it again. The force of the Hebrew is, for 40 years, you wouldn't believe, now you can't believe. You wouldn't hear, now you can't hear. You wouldn't see, now you can't see. And God was saying to that generation, I am going to anesthetize you and your rebellion. I'm going to fix and confirm you and your rebellion, and I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to extend any uh, illumination, any understanding of my word, any perception of my word anymore. In fact, I'm going to judge you and your carcasses are going to fill the wilderness, and another generation will go in. And God was saying in a presidential way to all people, there is a point where God would say to a people, you wouldn't believe, now you can't believe. You wouldn't hear, now you can't hear. You wouldn't see, now you can't see. And if he's saying anything to America, it's this tonight. For 400 years, we were founded on the dictum 
for the glory of God and the propagation of the, of the Christian faith enshrined in the Mayflower Compact. And after 400 years, God's saying to America, you wouldn't believe, now you can't believe. You wouldn't hear, now you can't hear. You wouldn't see, now you can't see. And I will anesthetize you, and I will fix you, and I will confirm you in your rebellious, contumacious, and obstructionist behavior. There is a time when God would say, the demarcation line is crossed, and I will not enlighten the eyes anymore. I will not illumine the ears to understand, and I will not give faith to believe in me. And in fact, Paul quotes that scripture in Romans 11, verse 8, where it said, God gave them a spirit of stupor, a spirit of stupor. And the word stupor in the Greek is katanikos, and it means to prick something so that something be so that a part of your body becomes numb to prick a part of the body so it becomes numb and paul said that god sent them a stupor so that they would become numb to the things of god and that's a judgment of god and god is doing this to america right now he's sending a numbness to people i was telling somebody the other day I was talking to, I said to this lady that knows the Lord very well, I said, I used to speak in a church in Bellflower, and I would look out over the service, and I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, uh, my voice is not soft. My, my, uh, my, my dialogue is not soft, and I preach hard. But as I would look up over the congregation, people would be asleep. Someone there, someone here, someone there. And that became a commentary of the church itself, that they were benumbed to the things of God. They were benumbed to the word of God. They were benumbed to the spirit of God. They were benumbed to the enlightenment of God. And that's what Paul said. God sent them a spirit of stupor that they would not be able to see, hear, or apprehend the things of God. This is a very, very uh, trying, and um, as we would say, it is a very uh, challenging status to be in as a people when God has sent this to a nation, because the remnant prays for God to hear them. Now go with me to Psalms 28, verse 1. Psalms 28, verse 1. To thee, O Lord, I call my rock. Do not be silent to me. Do not be death to me. Lord, if thou be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to thee for help. To thee, O Lord, I call my rock. Do not be death to me. The psalmist was saying, I cry to you, to Lord, I cry. And it's a Hebrew word that means I cry with urgency. I cry with emergency because you're my Lord. Lord is Yahweh. It means the one that has all life inside him by his eternal nature. He has everything that I will need for time and eternity. He doesn't turn to, he doesn't turn to national leadership. He doesn't turn to anything on this earth. He is divorced of that. He's divested of that. He turns to the one God that has within his nature all that he will need. And you know, we don't learn that endemically. We learn that by God putting us in cul-de-sacs where we learn to turn to God. I, 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 even today, I, I, I read prayers of people that, and I'm sure because they have not been taught, but they're praying for things that God is a posteriori to what God is doing. They're praying that God would deliver us from the evil. They would deliver us from judgment. They would deliver us from what is coming on the earth. But that's not what God, that God will not answer that prayer because God has architected this. He has designed this. He has been a, he's been a forbearance God for 400 years to America. And the prayer should be, God, 
Strengthen your remnant. Strengthen us in the midst of your judging a nation. Strengthen us in the midst of decline. Strengthen us in the midst of evil. Let your power clothe us so that we will stand tall under your favor in the midst of a crumbling world. Not that you would stave your judgment because the the dam of his forbearance has already started to break. My rock, do not be deaf to me. The rock is a, it, it is a metaphor of the permanence, the unshakableness, the, the immutability, the, 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 the eternal permanency of the character of God. When, we, when God is called the rock in Scripture, it says you can plant your life on that for time and eternity. And everything in your sightseeing world will collapse around you, but you will stand. And, and even if you're, you say, well, Larry, tonight, I can't even stand. Well, lay on the rock. Fall on the rock. Be prostrate on the rock. Prostrate on the rock. Because he's underneath you. The rock is a metaphor. That he's underneath his people when everything is shaken around them. He shakes everything from us and we're left with what? The reality of a permanent God. The reality of an unchangeable God. The reality of a faithful God. The reality of an eternal, reliable God. A dependable God. And in that, the situation that we see drives us to the rock. The rock that we stand upon. There was an... There was a Puritan of the 18th century named William Evans, and he he tersely said, I am weakness itself, but I am on the rock. I am weakness itself, but I am on the rock. Tonight, if you say to God, I am weakness, that's, that's, that's beauty to the ears of God, because that's the person that's, that's prostrate on the rock of God. Can you say that tonight? I am weakness, but I am on the rock. That's what we should, that's the equation that God is looking for. Do not be death to me. When the psalmist cried out death, it's a word that means do not be inattentive to me. Do not turn your attention from me and let my cry go unabated. In the midst of a world where he saw the silence, he heard the silence of God because God was not talking to the nation anymore. He was not raising prophets up anymore. But he said, God, don't be deaf to me because I'm on the rock. Listen to my cry, O God. You may be, you may be silent to the nation and speaking to the nation in judgment and wrath, and you may not speak to them in grace and mercy anymore, but God, hear my cry because I'm standing on the rock. Lord, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. He said, if I don't hear from you in a fresh manner, God, I'm like the person in the grave. I'm hopeless. I'm destitute. And that's the, that's the condition that God wants his people in this hour. Do we realize without a fresh understanding of God's word, we're like a hopeless corpse in the grave? What does it say in Deuteronomy 8, 3? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. When we reach a place where we realize our sustenance truly does not come from a dead and dying world, but it comes from the mouth of God. And that sustenance of what Jesus called himself, he's called himself living bread from heaven, that that is the sustenance that will take us for time and eternity. And that's the only sustenance that we we need in this hour because it will change us. It will provide for us. It will give us eyes to see the throne. It will give us divine optimism in the midst of a earthly, depression, and we will see divinely, optimistically, the throne of God and a sovereign God who rules on the throne. God in all of his sovereignty has not been preached for so long by the vast majority of churches in America. Man's will has been elevated. God has been diminished. 
But in this hour, we cry out to God on the rock. Don't be deaf to us, God. Let us see your throne. And he who occupies the throne. Because when we see you, that's divine optimism. We, we can face tomorrow because we know it's in the, the thermostat of, our, of the nation's life. You have your fingers on. It's not in the hands of a Democratic Party. It's not even in the hands of a Republican Party. It's not in the hands of capitalism. It's in the hands of an almighty God. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to thee for help. The word supplications is the Hebrew word hanan, and it means grace. And it's first used in Exodus 34, verse 6, when God says, I'm a gracious God. And the word hanan means I will do all for you that you would never be able to do for yourself. It means I will do for you what you will never be able to do for yourself. And then we ask, what is that? That's everything. That's who's a candidate for grace. Those who realize that they cannot do anything for themselves. They've been extracted of self-sufficiency. And then the grace of God comes into the fore. And they learn to live by the Hanan, or what he called the supplications. That means a prayer that's asking for the grace the, the, the provision of God to come down into me and become to me what I can never become endemically in myself. And that's why we, that's why that one song, if there's one song that's ever been penned by mortal man that can be taken into eternity, it's the song of Newton, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That, that, that song is an elucidation of what Hanan means. It means he must do all the work because I can't do anything. And when we cry out in that manner, it says, you become, I cry to thee for help. That's the word Izor. And it means, I want, oh God, be my ally. Be my ally, oh Lord. Just like nations have allies that come to their aid in the time of war because unless they have an ally, they will go down to defeat. The psalmist said, unless you come to my aid right now, God, I'm going down to defeat under the world that's collapsing. And in this night, we cry out, oh God, do not turn a deaf ear to your people. Let us tap into the graciousness of your nature and be an ally to us and all that you are. Go now to Psalms 39, verse 12. 39. Verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my ears. Do not be silent at my tears. For I am a stranger with thee, a sojourner like all my fathers. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. What is the constant cry of the psalmist, O Lord, do not be silent unto me. You may be silent to the nation. You may be silent to Judah. You may be silent to northern Israel. But God, do not be silent to me. Because if you don't answer me, I cannot go on. And in these passages we're reading, we are, we are reiterating that the greatest nightmare of the Old Testament Jew was the silence of God. When he would no longer speak in grace and mercy, but he would thunder in wrath and chastening to a people. And we, as we gave a precedent, they've known the silence of God. And not only in the past, but the Jew, after 70 AD, they knew the silence of God up until 1948. In 70 AD, Jesus told them in Luke 21, that they, would be, that they would be conquered by the Romans after he died and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven. They would be conquered. And, 30, and approximately 40 years later, that judgment came. And for 2,000 years, the Jews were in dispersion. They were displaced all over the known world. But in 1948, 
that silence was broken by God. They were brought back to the land, and it was a signal illustration to the world that my silence could go longer than 400 years. It could go longer than 700 years. It could go 2,000 years. So when we talk about the silence of God, the Jew understood it from 70 A.D. under the judgment of Titus and the Roman legion under the direction of God to 1948, they knew the silence of God. Do not be silent at my, at my tears. He used a word for silence there. It's a word to, to have your tongue uh, stuck to the roof of your mouth. It's kind of an interesting word. He said, God, don't be tongue-tied. It's kind of an amusing thing. He said, God, don't be mute to me. I, I, I'm desperate, Lord. I must hear you speak through your word to me. For I am a stranger with thee. That word stranger is gur in the Hebrew. It says, God, speak to me because I have no native home down here. I'm a resident alien. It's a word, it's a, it's a humiliating word, as so many Hebrew words are. It means a, one, a person that owns no land, that has no home to call his home down here. He said, God, I'm a stranger down here. I'm passing through. I don't own anything. I, I'm a resident alien. I'm living in the midst of a foreign world. And I'm not at home here. It's not my home, God. And if David wrote this, it was like him saying, I may be the king, but I'm out of place down here, Lord. This is not my real home. It's with you. And he buttresses that by saying, Lord, don't be silent to me, for I am a stranger with thee. That's a whole Hebrew word, tesoa, and it means, it means someone that is, so, is a foreigner and not giving any rights of citizenship. He's a foreigner. He said, God, I, 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 I don't even have a green card here. I'm passing through. I'm a pilgrim. I don't have anything here I call home. And that's why I'm asking you to hear my cry and not be silent to me because I have nothing here. Nothing here. The church has lost the sense that we're strangers and pilgrims in this world. I told somebody today, the church in the 1960s and 70s used to sing a song, I am a stranger and a pilgrim just traveling through this pilgrim world. I have a home on yonder city and I won't turn back. The church won't sing that today because they don't believe this is a, is a temporary abode. They believe this is their home. They believe this is their heaven. And they don't want to go to heaven because heaven to them it would, be a, it, it, it would be a disruption of their good life on the earth here. So they don't have an appetite. And so what, what is that someone who has no appetite for the true home? That's not their home. This is their home. Charles Spurgeon said, 1870, great expositor about this word. I, and he uses the word, I'm a stranger with thee. He said, God, I'm not only the one traveling through, but you're traveling with me. You're an alien too, God. You're an alien to the tribe of Judah. You're an alien to the ten tribes of the north. They've forgotten who you are. And I'm traveling through this world. It's not my home, but it's not your home either, Lord, because they don't recognize you. They don't acknowledge you. They, they've forgotten who you are, and you're out of place in your own world. And Charles Spurgeon wrote, 1870, God made the world. He sustains it. He owns it. And yet men treat him as, they, as though he were a foreign intruder. And as they treat the master, so, the, so do they deal with his servants. Isn't that amazing? They treat God as a foreign intruder. John Gill, who wrote in 1780, said, We have no settlement here, nor is our rest and satisfaction in the things of this world. We value themselves while here as not at home, 
but in a foreign land. What was Gill saying? Even though we live here, we live that this we we view this place as a foreign land, not as our home. What was it said about Jesus in John 1:10? He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Amazing declaration. He was in the world, meaning his he came as man, and the world was made through him, dia. Means every grain of sand, every atom of creation, every molecule of air, every mountain, every lake, every stream was made by him. It had to pass through his will. And yet the world did not know him. Genosco, meaning they didn't have a love, a deep, intimate understanding of who he was. They looked at him and they didn't see their creator, they didn't see the one who made everything. Their eyes did not see the one who spoke everything into being. And at every square inch of the earth and the universe, they didn't see him as the owner of everything. When they looked at him, what was their evaluation? He's Joseph's son. He's the carpenter of Nazareth. But they didn't see him as the owner of the universe, as the possessor of heaven and earth. They saw him as someone who was a foreigner in the midst of his own world. In Philippians 3.20, in a passage of Scripture where Paul said in the previous two verses, the enemies of the cross are people that love a dying world whose appetite is on the things of this world. And he said those are people that are enemies of the cross. He said, everyone that ap- has an appetite for this world, whether it's from the belly or any other appetite, he said, they're enemies of the cross. If you're in love with the dying world, you're enemies of the cross. And he said, if you're enemies of the cross, you're not citizens of that world. And he said, no, you're not, that your citizens is not here, but it's in heaven where your name has been written. That's where our true citizenship lies, that he writ. He wrote us in his citizenship book before the dawn of time. And he secured our citizenship before the universe was made. And he wrote it, if you will, in the blood of his own son. And said, my son's inheritance will be in the citizen record of of my heaven. And they're just strangers and pilgrims here. What did Peter call the church in the midst of the... Neronian persecution in 1 Peter 2.11, he said, you're strangers and pilgrims here. You're just resident aliens. You're just, you're just passing through. You're pilgrims. Why did we call the men and women who founded the America pilgrims? Because they came on the most arduous of journey across an Atlantic where maybe 50% died on the first voyage. They came to an uncharted land, and they were called pilgrims. And that moniker stuck with him. But we're pilgrims. As the psalmist said, I'm a sojourner with you, God. I'm traveling through the world with you. This world does not recognize you as the owner. It doesn't recognize you as the creator. You're out of place in the world that you own. But I'm traveling with you, Lord. And he said, I have an affinity with you that I'm traveling with a God that's out of place in his own world. In his own world. A sojourner like all my fathers. And because of that, he said, God, do not be silent to me because I'm traveling with you through this world. Now go to Psalms 83, verse 1. 83 verse 1. Oh God, do not remain quiet. Do not be silent, oh God. Do not be still. The literal Hebrew says, Oh God, let there be no rest to thee. Oh God, let there be no rest to thee. He was crying out, God, do not be inattentive or just an onlooker. He says, oh God, do not 
remain quiet. Do not be at rest with me. Do not be silent. That's that, that's that word again, domai. It means do not. It's like someone that's tongue-tied. He's saying to God, don't be tongue-tied to me, O God. He's not being irrele- ir- ir- irreligious. He's not being irreverent to God. But he's crying out from desperation. He's saying, God, please speak to me through your word. I need to hear from you like a transfusion from heaven. And he says, oh, God, do not be still. And he uses that word, oh, God, O-L. The word in Hebrew means the mighty God, the mighty one. It's the root of the word Elohim that appears in Genesis 1-1. He says, I'm crying out to the God who made everything. He's saying, God, you spoke everything into being. And don't be silent to me. You spoke me into being. You spoke the stars into being. You spoke the planets into being. You spoke earth into being. And now speak to me, O oh God, by the power of your word. There's such a parallelism here that you don't see on the surface of the text in the English. The first word, O oh God, is Elohim. He says, to the creator God, the word, the God that spoke everything into being, do not be named silent. Then he said, do not remain silent. O, o L, do not be silent or still. He's saying, God, if you spoke everything into being at the beginning and your word sustained everything for all these years, he didn't understand the longevity of the universe and the longevity of to the earth. But he's saying, God, your word is powerful. If you, do, if you did that, then speak a word to me so you take me through what I'm facing, taking me through what I'm looking upon, taking me through the people that are surrounding me and trying to take my life. Now to go now go to Micah 3, verse 4. And this is a desperate cry of the prophet when a nation trans they transgress and they enter into the time of the quietness of God. Then they will cry out, and, and, and this is a time of of Amos and a time of northern Israel, about 750 B.C. Micah 3, 4, then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. There is a time when the majority, there is a time when a large numeric of a nation cry out to God, but they, but God will not answer them because their prayer is with ulterior motives. They're praying for God to deliver them from judgment, to deliver them from his wrath, to deliver them from evil, to uh, evil leadership that God's put there to deliver them into a state of of renewed prosperity and renewed security and renewed political philosophy. But God will not hear that prayer. They will, because Israel, even when they were debauched, would cry out to God. But they would cry out with ulterior motives. Cry out, spare us from our enemies. Spare us from our uh, aggressors. God, bring prosperity back to us. Deliver us from pestilence. Deliver us from drought. Deliver us from biological death. But they were not crying out. We repent of what has brought on the judgment. We repent of what has brought on evil. We repent of the wickedness that's at the core of our nation and people and of a lot of preaching. We repent of all of it. So God would not hear that prayer because it was ulteriorly clothed and guised in self-aggrandizement. And Micah said there will be a time they will cry 
in desperation to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. The word evil is wrath. It means they have taken everything of God and they've broken it. They've corrupted it. They've perverted it. They've distorted it. They've redefined everything of truth. And they've not asked God to repent of that. They just want to be spared. They want to be redeemed from it, delivered from it. But not confessing the sins that's brought it on. And God says, I will be silent to them in grace. I'll be silent in mercy. But he will thunder in his wrath. And when it says he turns his face, that is a horrific posture where it says he will turn his favor away from them and they will no longer know the favor of God. They will know the wrath and displeasure of Almighty God. I don't take glee in the things that I say and teach. I know that we've entered into treacherous times in America where we have crossed the demarcation line. We've tripwired the judgment and wrath of God. He will provide, as we will see, and protect his remnant because that is his. But for the majority, they will not hear the voice of God. You would not believe, now you can't believe. You would not see, now you can't see. You would not hear, now you can't hear. And God will ossify a people into that status. Turn with me to Jeremiah 7, starting at verse 24. Verse 24, this is at a time about 590 B.C. where he had told them repeatedly uh, that he was going to come and he would send judgment in the form of Babylon, of Nebuchadnezzar, and he would bring a horrific judgment upon the land. So in that passage, Jeremiah, God, is, God tells the prophet, Since the days that your father came out of the land of Egypt until this day, how long would that be? It would be almost eight, it would be 700 years. So what God is telling Jeremiah, he said, I've given you 700 years of grace. From the moment he, they, your forefathers were brought out of Egypt, today it's about 700 years. So then he, and take, keep that chronology in mind. Since the days that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt unto this day, I have sent you all my servants, the prophets, daily rising early and sending them. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did not eat. They did more evil than their forefathers, than their fathers. In other words, God said, I spoke to you. I spoke to you for 700 years. Seven centuries, God's telling them, you have no qualms. You have no defense when I send my judgment and my silence of mercy because I spoke to you for 700 years. God has spoken to America for 400 years. 400 years he's spoken to America. And you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not listen to you and you shall call to them, but they will not answer you. And you shall say to them, 
This is the nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord. Their God are except correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. God said to them through the prophet Jeremiah, they have believed so many lies that they don't speak one word of truth any longer. And that I've taken understanding from them and they don't understand one word of my truth any longer. They only under, they only believe lies and they can no longer understand truth. Cut off your hair and cast it away and take up a lamentation on the on the bare heights for the Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. When someone cut their hair and cast it away, it was a sign of mourning. Mourning. He said, Jeremiah, go into mourning. Go into mourning. Because you're mourning death. They're dead. Your people are dead. The nation is dead. They're dead to me. Go into mourning, Jeremiah, because they're like one vast corpse to me. They're dead. And he said, you tell them. And this is the most horrific words that a people could ever hear. They have rejected and forsaken, for the Lord has Rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. You know why he forsook them? Jeremiah said over and over that they forsook God. He used the Hebrew word azab. And it means to turn your back on God. To ignore God. To abandon God. To, 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 to live as if he doesn't exist. And Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 116, 2.13, 2.17, 2.19, 5.7, 5.19, 9.13, 16.11, 17.13, 9.4, said, you have forsaken God, Azab. He said, you have turned your back on God. You've abandoned his word. You've killed his prophets. You've despised his word. And you've acted like he doesn't even exist. And now he will forsake you. He said that repeatedly. And it's another Hebrew word. Jeremiah 7, 29, 15, 6, 23, 33, and 23, 39. It's a Hebrew word, Natsah. It said, God will forsake you. And it's a different word. When they forsook God, it, it meant, the word means you turn your back on him. You abandon him. You ignore him. But when God uses the word forsake, it means I will remove my protection upon you. I will let you become a prey to all your enemies. I will leave you desolate. When God says, I will forsake you, he's saying, I'm going to remove my protection upon you. I'm going to let you be a prey to every enemy. I'm going to leave you desolate. That would be quite of a presidential candidate speech for somebody running for office, wouldn't it? You stand up at the Republican National Committee in their confirmation convention and you stand up and say I stand before you as your nominee for president but I have one message for you God has removed his protection his alignment his security his defense from America, and he's left you desolate to every enemy on the face of the earth. 
You think you would get an applause for that? But that's the only message. Jeremiah, you tell them. This is a generation of my wrath. The word wrath is Ebra. Ebra. It means to overflow. It means God can't be more angry anymore. He's angry. He's taken it so long. He can't hold his anger in anymore. He can't hold his righteous anger because he's a holy and pure God. He can't restrain it anymore. It's a word that means God can't hold it back anymore. He has to let it out. Yibra! We have reached a stage in America where God's calling America, you're the generation of my Ibra. I will not hold back my wrath anymore. I will not let you do this to my name. I will not let you commit wickedness and get away with it anymore. I will not let you pervert truth, distort truth, follow false voices of the economic, religious, political realm. I will not let it go on anymore. I will let it out. Jeremiah, you tell them it's too late. They can fast. They can pray. They can wail. They can cry. But it's to no avail. It's over. It's over. The dam. It's broken. And as I said a week ago, if I had any ulterior motive, you think I would preach this kind of message? This kind of message doesn't endear you to anybody. It doesn't put you on the social media as a hero of the Christian church. For the sons of Judah have done that which is evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house which is called by my name to defile it. Why did he separate? He said, the house of Judah, sons of Judah. The sons of Judah was the line of David. That one line that was to be the promissory line out of which the Messiah would come. You don't think that was a privileged line? Of all the lines of the earth, the promised Redeemer would come. And where, what did they do? They were so blind. They set up in the house of God, meaning the temple in Jerusalem. They put other gods. We call it in religion syncretism. It's a word. They didn't dispense with God. They just assimilated God with all of the other gods of the world. And they said, you're one of many. And we want to ameliorate the other nations of the earth. We want to make treaties with them. We want to stave off their invasion. So we will take their gods as a, as a way of reconciling them not to invade us. And they will put us in the temple 
next to the, the worship of the true and living God. And God said, you've done more evil. The word evil again is raw. You've twisted. you perverted. You've distorted. You've broken everything I've ever said. In other words, he said, you're a perverse, corrupting, destroying generation. I'm not going to restore you. I'm not going to make you new. I'm not going to renovate you. I'm going to judge you because it's over. And God, then God elaborated how evil they were. And they have built the high places of Tobit, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Tobit means to burn, to burn in fire. And, hit, and Hinnom means, in the Hebrew, a valley of weeping or of tears. And they have burned their sons and daughters in the fire, which I, which I did not command. And did not come ever into my mind. The very line of David. That was the royal line. They had become so demonic. They had become so demonic. And in Psalms 146 it said they sacrificed to devils. Shadim. That they took their sons and daughters and they, they put them in a large hand that represented the god of Molech, which was a regurgitation of the god of Baal, which was a demonic seduction that said that if you worship Baal, that he'll give you resurrection life. Not realizing God gives you eternal life. And they sacrificed children from the age of 12 to 20 from the line of David. They had become so perverse under the reign of Manasseh and Ahaz that they were trying to cut off their own line. They were so deceived. They were so filled with demonic power. They were, they were so renegade. They were trying to cut off their own line so Jesus would not have a line to come through to be born. And they sacrificed their children in the valley of weeping, the valley of tears. And God said, such a thing would never enter my mind. Man is so evil that he, he orchestrates. He he manufactures things in his mind that never find a place in God, ever. And it's heart-rending to even read that. He said, you tell them, Jeremiah, they're doing things that would never find a place. in my mind. And you tell them you're not going to get away with it because this is what I'm going to do. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will be, when it will be called no more Tobeth of the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Tobit, meaning burning, because there will be no other place. And the dead bodies of the people will be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and no one will frighten them away. So you tell them they're not going to get away with all of their sins. Because when Nebuchadnezzar comes in under my leading, There'll be such a carnage in Jerusalem. So many, and, and the valley of Hinnon is a valley that's right to the south of Jerusalem. It's a, it's a stone's throw from the city of the temple in Jerusalem. 
If you have a good arm, you could throw a rock from the temple and land in the valley of Hinnon. And God said, I'm going to fill it with all the bodies of all of the slain that I've told and raised up Nebuchadnezzar to judge you. And they will fill that valley with carcasses as a sign they can't get away with their sin. And that valley was so cursed that during the time of Jesus, it had become a garbage dump. It was called Gehenna. It was the city garbage dump during the time of Jesus in Jerusalem. It was Jerusalem's garbage dump where they would dump all of the roughish, all, the, all of the, uh, the garbage and the refuse in that dump, and they had fires that burned 24 hours a day. And a worm began to live there that lived in the fires. And, Je and Jesus made uh, uh, illusion to that, and he said, you think hell is bad? Look at Gehenna. Hell is going to be worse than Gehenna, the valley of the burning. Gehenna is a garbage dump that every Jew could understand how heinous it was. And Jesus said, hell will be worse than the garbage dump if you go into eternity without me. A people could reach a point when they do things that God says would never even pass through my mind. As we bring this message to a close, I have an admonition for you tonight. I have an admonition for you this evening. I have been telling you that that the Dobbs decision of the Supreme Court was a decision that was a posteriori to the killing of the preborn, that it was not a great and glorious day for America. It only was a day that codified that what's been going on for over 50 years has been heinous, illegal, and damnable. Evil doesn't know any depths until God finally cuts it off. Evil by nature does not restrain itself because it has a mobility in, innately to it and that is to go into deeper and deeper levels of discounting what has come before and destroying everything that has laid a foundation. And once everything is destroyed, it puts in its place the personification of destruction and the destruction of the imageness of God and man. And until God cuts it off, it knows no debauchery. It, not, it knows no depth of its depravity. We live, if you live in California, we live in a state so debauched that taxpayer money is going to be used to fly women from all over the United States and probably will expand to Latin America that wants to kill the preborn in states that restrict it. In California, you can kill an unborn child up until the moment of its birth. I cannot find anyone in California that's ever been prosecuted for partial birth abortion. There is no limits in California to death. A baby can be killed at the moment of birth. 
But as if that is not enough, there is a bill that's working its way through the state legislature in Sacramento called AB 2223. And I will try to give you a synopsis as we wrap up this service. And I will call it a legal preamble, a legal preamble to expanding abortion rights, which under the Constitution, the Dobbs decision says do not exist. And the states will declare that. But this bill speaks of what is called perinatal rights, perinatal status of a woman. And the word means after birth. And, and theoretically, they're using the guise that if a woman has a child that dies in, in her before term, she cannot be prosecuted if there is a determination that she did something to bring the death of the child, such as if she was using amphetamines and causing the death of the child. In the past, a couple of women were prosecuted because the district attorney could, gave life to the child and determined the child had life. But that was so rare in California. It's not the rule. It is so minute. It is virtually non-existent. But they're using this as if it were a justification for giving women the right after birth. That after the child is born, perinatal, that if the child is alive after an abortion has not successfully destroyed it, and I know these are barbaric things that I speak of, that if a child has overcome that, it would give the woman the right to tell the health care professional, whoever they are, to let the child die. Put it over there, put it somewhere, do not give it any food, no, no hydration, and let the child die. It is a legal preamble that gives women's rights beyond abortion, beyond the womb, so that if they decide after birth, for whatever reason, now they're using the justification of a child damaged by abortional process, but it's just an introduction to saying that we can, if I, if I don't give worth to the child in the womb, and I don't give worth to the child out of the womb, then the child could be left to die. And the word perinatal means anywhere from the first, second after birth to maybe 28 days. And this is not something that has not been enunciated. There was a teacher in Harvard named Peter Singer. He teaches a class on ethics, oddly enough, that's the class. And he's been writing for years. There may come a time when we have to give the right to, to doctors and mothers to let a child die because the child, the child has no worthwhile life, no worthwhile life to live. So he laid the foundation for it over 15 years ago. So you look up this bill. AB means assembly bill. So what I'm saying is it was not enough that America has killed 68 million preborn children and committed grievous sins against God, but they want to even go beyond the debauchery. And, and Newsom now belongs to a council that he arranged called the Council on Abortion. In other words, he, he started a council called the Council of Death. If God would judge Israel after 700 years And we've heard the word of God for 400. Let me leave you with this analogy. 80 years ago, 80 years ago, we lost 420,000 men and some women on the soil of foreign lands in the air and sea, fighting for what 
Franklin Delano Roosevelt called a barbaric and an evil nation and doctrine. And he said, we must defeat the evil that is personified and the German ideas embodied in Hitler. And we lost 420,000 men in trying to defeat an evil so bad that viewed some human life as subhuman. And they were out not only to exterminate the Jew, but they were coming ultimately for the Christian and anyone that did not embrace their doctrine of a thousand-year reign under the rule of an autocrat, a dictator. But what has happened in the last 80 years? And this will tell you how far America has declined. We were considered the victor, the superior in the 1940s. We went over with the alignment of Britain and France and of other nations to defeat what Roosevelt called an evil. 80 years later, what has Germany become? Germany has become superior to their ethics and their mores and morals to America. We have become the barbarians, and we have become the evil. And I will state clearly what I mean. In Germany at the present time, every child is protected before birth that a woman can only abort that pregnancy after five weeks. She cannot abort that child after five weeks. It is prohibited. But she has to have a approval of a medical doctor in association with a psychiatrist in tandem saying that that pregnancy will lead her to afflict herself, hurt herself, or even cause her to die. And that's very rare to find a doctor and, a, and psychiatrist that agree because it's very rare in Germany that they give that approval. So in 80 years, a nation that we decimated, we leveled, and we built up with the Marshall Plan, where over 5 million Germans were killed during the war. But in 80 years, they have a value system that's so superior to ours, a value system that is so transcendent to ours, that we're the barbarian, we are the evil, and we are the despicable. Because in our state, there are no restraints on life. There are none. And now we have bills called the option to the end of life bill passed in 2017 that give, basically, it is a it is a right to death, right to suicide for a health care worker or an appointed of individual by a family can orchestrate the death of someone in their family that's aged and they're not prosecuted. And this AB 2223 would, not, would, would keep any prosecution of any mother or health care official from letting a child die. They could not be prosecuted. 80 years, we become the criminal. We become the barbarian. We become the evil. And every time I hear that Lee Greenwood song, it sickens me. How can anybody be proud of what America has become? How can any American be proud of what we are? How can any American be proud of the debauchery that's going on in America. You sickened me, Lee Greenwood. You made a million dollars off it. But you're a Republican hack. That's all you are. We're the barbarians. That's how we've declined under the 
and evil. We've crossed the demarcation line. God says, I have forsaken you. He will maintain his remnant. He will secure his people. And tonight, if you've heard his word, it's a miracle. And I want you to hear what Jesus said as we close this message before we go to communion. And maybe I was remiss to tell you, every time we're together, we have communion. Jesus used a phrase over and over in Revelation to tell the people about the, the paramountness, the importance of hearing the word of God. Revelation 2.7, 2.11, 2.17, 2.29. Revelation 3.6, 322, 322. Revelation 3.13 and Revelation 13.9, he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's a phrase that means everyone that's been given the capacity to hear, and the word hear is the Greek word akoi, and it's in a, it's in a present imperative. It means I'm commanding you to hear me. Everyone that's given the capacity to hear me, I'm commanding you to hear me. And the word hear, Greek, go back to Hebrew, uh, Shammai, it means listen attentively. Bring yourself under the authority of my word. Bring yourself under the obedience of my word. Bring yourself under the, uh, the sovereignty of my word. Not just let my words go into the ear canal, but bring your life under the authority of it. And Jesus said, anyone that's been given the capacity to hear, I'm commanding you to hear me. Because the vast majority, you're not going to hear. You're not going to see. You're not going to speak. You're not going to believe because I'm not going to give you the capacity to hear and to speak and to de decipher what I say. We need to pray. We pray this has been a sobering, Shocking message from the Word of God. Let's pray before we transition to communion. Lord, we come before your throne. We are people that we don't deserve anything. We're a wicked and a damnable nation. We deserve nothing. We don't, we don't deserve one more day of your grace. We don't deserve one more day of your bounty. We don't deserve one more day of your favor. We don't deserve nothing from you, God, but to do to us what you did to Judah and what you did to northern Israel and what you did to Jerusalem under the edict and judgment of Jesus. We don't pray that you stay your hand because that is a futile prayer. That is a prayer that you won't hear. As it says in Jeremiah 15.1, Jeremiah, if Moses and Samuel stood before you and prayed, I wouldn't hear the three of you. They passed the point of no return. But we know you hear the prayer if we pray to, to stain your people, Lord, and bring the few that's not yet been brought in, that's attained to salvation, bring them in to your family. Sustain your people that are under the, 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 un, un, under the uh, oppression of this evil. Sustain them. Strengthen them. Fortify them by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why he has come. He has come to represent you, that he will do for us what you would do if you stood for us right in the flesh. Let people understand that in their homes right now. They feel oppressed. They feel forlorn. They feel forsaken. They feel like they're nothing. They feel like no one cares. Let them know the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus in their midst. And He will do for them, in them, through them, what Jesus would do if He stood there right before them now. He is Christocentric. He does everything that the Son would do. 
Holy Lord, minister through your spirit. Strengthen families that listen to this. Strengthen parents that listen to this. Strengthen that Christian that seems cut off from everything. Strengthen those that are under such assault. Raise a, a wall of protection around them. Throw off the assaults of the evil one. And let the words of Jesus triumph through them. And let they stand when all around us the earth is crumbling. Let they stand as a testimony. My people will stand until I come in the midst of a world because I'm still in the midst of my people. And bring someone back to you tonight, Lord. Don't let them stay in the tomb. Raise them from the dead. Bring them to you. May the word produce faith in them tonight. Draw them to you. And we ask you, give them the gift of repentance. And we ask all this in the name of him. I have no strength to do anything. I can't save a flea, God. That's why I depend upon you. Because I know if you don't do it, it will not be done. I've done the best that I can tonight, Lord. I'm frail. I'm weak. My language is not big enough to say what I truly want to say. My words are not descriptive enough and animated enough to say what I want to say. But take the paltriness of what I've said and use it for your glory. And use it for your glory. We seek not anything but to provide sustenance to your people. In an hour, we're living in famine of hearing the word of the Lord. Let them hear your word. And let them drink, drink from wells in the midst of the desert. And let them eat from manna in a barren land. Let them hear from you and discount every other voice. Take the paltriness of what I am. And if you could just touch one soul, touch it for your glory. <laughs> for your glory. Oh God, we deserve nothing. We deserve nothing. We fall upon you. We are a barbarian people. We live in an evil nation. Let us hear from you, oh God. Let us hear from you. And we cry out as the psalmist be not silent, O oh God, until our cry. Let us see. 
let us hear and let us have the gift of faith to believe in Jesus' name. Amen. You can pause the you can pause the if you're listening, we're gonna have communion and you get the elements, and I'm going to take a drink of liquid, and I ask your, your indulgence while I do that. It's very hot. We have, uh, we have many bright lights in this studio, and I, I don't want to be in, inglorious in doing that. We go to Matthew 26, verse 26. We have communion every service because Justin Martyr, the early church writer in around the latter part of the first century, said that every time the church came together, they sang hymns to Christ as God. They had the dissemination of the word and they distributed the elements. And we do that. Uh, it has been a formality or a tradition of the church to have it once a month. That is not coming from the texts of Scripture or the lifestyle of the early church. And I want some of you that have listened to me repetitiously teach on communion to become so. Uh, well taught that you can take communion yourself and lead others in communion because there's coming a time when a wicked world will try to separate voices within the church as the, as the Roman Empire did to take leaders of teaching away from the church to sow discord and division and confusion. But it will be incumbent upon you to lead your family, to lead other believers into communion and into the rudiments of Christ wherever you are before his coming. I don't know when he's coming, but I know there's a statement in Judaism that we can see the footprints of the Messiah. We can see the footprints of the Messiah. We can see his coming is near at hand. And I don't think it is, it, it, it would be liberal to say this, that we are on the threshold of his coming. But we read from Matthew 26 at the Passover meal because he was the Passover lamb. And we read. Verse 26, and while they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take. That is a command. It's not an option for communion. It's a command. Take, eat. This is my body. The bread that they took was called matzah. Matzah was unleavened bread. And leaven to a Jew spoke of the sin of Adam. And leaven by nature has a permutating character. You, a woman, you know what it is to take a piece of dough from a prior baking and put it in dough. It will permeate the rest of the dough and it will rise. And leaven is a permutating corruption. And they said, Adam's leaven leavened the whole mass of humanity, meaning leaven, Adam's sin, affected all of humanity. So when Jesus said, this is my bread, he says he's the unleavened bread. He doesn't have the sin of Adam in him. And why is that important? Because if he had one taint of sin in his nature, he is not qualified to die as the Passover lamb. And the background to that is Exodus, the 12th chapter. If he had one 
germ of sin in his mind, in his heart. He could not qualify. It's a Passover lamb. He has to be holy. He has to be pure. Just like the Passover lambs that went through over 70 inspections at the time of the Passover in Jerusalem, and, and they had to have a stamp put on them that they were investigated and they were seen to be few of marks and, and any kind of, of uh, physical malady before they could be sacrificed. Jesus is the Passover lamb. As Paul would write in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it said, Jesus, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. And in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it said, he is the unblemished and spotless lamb. And that's very interesting because Peter and John would go into the temple on the last Passover and they would bring a sacrifice lamb back to the Passover meal that spoke of the death of Jesus. And that lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus is saying, that, sacri- that spotless lamb is me. I'm qualified. And because I'm qualified, I could have your sin transferred to me by the Father. And with attendant to that sin is wrath. The sin that the soul that sinneth that shall die. The day that the day that you eat thereof, you shall die. The wages of sin is death. So God the Father transfers the attendant judgment of the sin that He placed on His Son to the Son, and He would die as the Passover Lamb as a substitutionary sacrifice in my place, in your place, and the place of all of those who the Father gave to the Son in eternity as His inheritance. So tonight when we take the unleavened bread, we're saying we celebrate. We're eternally grateful and and, and our worship is unbounded. That the sinless, spotless, pure Lamb of God took our sin nature and became sin, 1 Corinthians 5.21, a sin offering on our behalf. He took our wrath. He absorbed it. So that Paul would write in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, he has delivered us from the wrath to come. There's coming wrath on the cosmos and earth, but we've been delivered from it because of his sinless body and the Father poured out his wrath on his sinless son that took our sin. Let's take it in his sinless name. Amen. Lord, we thank you. The pure one was defiled because of us. We are so defiled that he he who knew no sin became a sin offering. And we owe you everything for that. And when he had taken a cup, he gave thanks. He gave it unto them saying, drink. That is a command. Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. The cup is the currency of heaven. It's the price that was paid to buy a people out of the agora, the slave market of death. There's a price upon our heads for sin. The wages of sin is death. Psalms 49 said if a brother tried to amass all of human currency all of his lifetime to ransom or buy back the life of one soul, he could not do it. You could take all the wealth of Bezos and Zuckerberg and Eli Musk and put them together, and they could not redeem one soul, including themselves, from the tomb of death. They could take all their billions And Psalms 49 says, that man's wealth cannot ransom one soul. It takes the currency of the Son of God. The currency of the Son of God. When he shed his blood, he said, the Son of Man has come not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 10, 28, the word ransom, lutron, means a price paid to redeem forfeited lives. A price paid to redeem forfeited lives. We were in the Agora, the marketplace of death. He walks down the Agora. He walks down the Agora. 
And he called your name one day. He called your name one day. And he said, death can't hold you. The chains of death can't hold you any longer. Because I have the price to pay you out. To buy you out. Because I have shed my blood. That's the currency that will buy you out. And when we heard his name, the chains went off. The chains of death, of the eyes, the ears, the mouth. We could hear, we could see, we have a heart for him. And death has no more control over us because he put life within us. And he said, you're mine. You're my possession. You're mine. And I pray tonight that he would walk down the Agora and say to one person of the far reaches of this message, whether it be in Latin America, America, or the Middle East, or Europe, he would say, call your name. And he'd say, come forth. Come forth. Because I have ordained you to eternal life. And when you come forth, you can hear his name. Just as Lazarus knew his name. You know when you're resurrected because you become the property of Jesus. And you know that by his word. And when he redeems you, the word is an agora word, you become the possession of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6.20 He has bought us with a price. We are his inheritance in the earth. He's coming back for his inheritance. We are what he died for, his inheritance. We belong to him. Nothing can touch us unless it goes to the volitional will of Christ and hit us because we are his segula, a Hebrew word that means the king's treasure and the earth. So we take this tonight, and when we take it, this is the goal. I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from you until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. There's coming a day when we have been redeemed for one purpose, to live before his face, to live before his face. Just as close as Moses and Elijah were to him, on the Mount of Transfiguration, so will we be to him throughout all eternity. And we will dialogue with him, whether that's in the form of a language frame that we use now, or just heart-to-heart language that we will know as we will know. It will be in a communication that will be far superior to what we have now, but it will be based on his blood. We are what he died for. He owns the creation by power. He owns us by the currency of his blood. We take this in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you for all that you are. Let your people be embossed upon their heart. They are not their own. They've been bought with a price. And that when you said for the cross, from the cross to last I, you said paid in full. It was paid in full from your people. You took the dogma. You took all of the IOUs that we that were held against us, the wages of sin that were held against us, and you paid it all. We have no mortgage over us. That's been paid. We're free, but we're free to serve because we're your possession. Let these words mean something to your people of eternal value. Let them know that their worth comes from the blood of Christ and that they are your special possession in the earth. In Jesus' holy name, amen. My brother, I give you this epilogue. I say it every time we're together. It's the Hebrew word shalom. It means may every part of your being be brought into harmony by the will of God, by the Spirit of God. My brother, at the conclusion of this message, I pr- I ask that the shalom of God will come over you. In the midst of a wicked world, in the midst of a world like we're at sea and we're in the middle of a hurricane, but let's not forget he's in the boat, he's the captain. And he sleeps in the midst of the storm because all the molecules are under his control. My brother, let him let you hear his voice say, peace be still this night. He's not agitated. He's not worried. He's there in the boat. He's the captain. My brother. I say to you, Shalom, my sister. I say to you, Shalom Aleichem. May every part of your being be brought into harmony with the will of God by the Spirit of God. Don't you be diverted by all these men and women that are trying to have these 
cottage ministry conferences just to make money. Now they have things called reserve seating, front row seating, this kind of seating, luncheon seating, dinner seating, just a way to make money. And if you want to hear the word of God, you hear you hear the word of God here. You know how to live in a world that's collapsing? Fall on your knees, open empty hands, and say, God, give me the power of the Holy Spirit to go through. And there is no, and, and there's no uh, magic wand about this. God's not going to restrain the judgment. He is not going to restrain what he's bringing on America. He's not going to bring a new day, a blessing on America. Those days are over. The Lee Greenwood days, they're over. They're over. He will maintain his people and prepare them for his coming. He will clothe us with his power, and that will take us through. My sister, shalom aleichem. And until you hear from me next week in a Maranatha message, I use the Aramaic word, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, amen.